computer. Okay. So we need the attendance slide. Like, do I have everything? Yes, I think so. Okay. How y'all doing? Good. Thursday. It's almost Friday. Oh, y'all. I can't believe I didn't tell last period this. This is one of my favorite days. You know, my favorite day. She's <laughs> like, I don't know. Thursday. I don't call it Thursday. It's better than Thursday. It's Friday Eve. <laughs> And so, so, so the story behind that is um, my son was super excited about Christmas Eve. And from now on, we don't call anything the actual day. We call it the eve of the day before, you know, just, you know, <laughs> the day, yeah, the day before. So, you know, it's Friday Eve. It's great. Okay, so I think I started that meeting. Am I on Zoom? I think I am, but I'm not sharing my screen. Let me make it big so I can see all my options. Hello, everyone. Okay, let's see. Share the screen. Okay, here we go. All right. So I have a few little things I want to go over with y'all before we start actual chemistry. Um, so first of all, the clickers. If you, people last time who had a problem, who had the actual white remote, you know, the, the white thing, they were having problems getting on. And it was my fault because, it's always my fault, but it's okay. It's my fault because what I should have done, I don't really see it now. Why don't I see it? Oh, because I'm not on the whole page. Because I needed to add a course block to Moodle that says iClicker. So this is only for the white handheld ones. But if you have a white handheld one, what you should do is go to Moodle, open course blocks, and then over here, do student registration. You'll register your iClicker with my class, and then it should work. But if you're using the app, don't worry about it. And then everybody should be good on the clicker. Because starting on Monday, not Monday, Tuesday, we're going to do some points, eye clicker points. So you want to make sure your eye clicker works before Tuesday. All right. Okay, so that's eye clicker. If your eye clicker does not work today, you should go to, I don't know, this is going to be weird, but go to, see where it says 5T attendance problems? That actually brings up the 4T sheet. So click the 4T one and it actually brings up 5T. That was my bad. And I actually need to change the permissions so y'all can go in there and actually edit. Yeah. Okay, so now if you're having problems with clicker when we do attendance in a minute, um, you're gonna tell me what's going on and put it right there. Okay, so we took care of that. What's next on my list? Oh. And I forgot, I should have said that while I was up. When you fill this out, you need to tell me first name, last name, are you remote, provide an explanation, give me your email. You need to fill in all of the little places so that I can get the right information. Because last class period, some people didn't give me all the information and I couldn't help them because I don't have all the information. So make sure if you need help, you put me all the information so I can help you out. Okay, now let's see. Oh, Zoom, Zoom, if you are at home or if you are remote, does not matter. I'm asking that you please put your complete first and last name on Zoom. Some people ask me some questions and things like that and I wanna help y'all out, but some people used like an abbreviation of their name and I can't figure it out. So please, when you are in Zoom, use your complete first and last name, okay? Uh, oh, and did y'all see the good news that your homework got extended until Friday? Lots of people were having um, Pearson, the publisher website problems, and um, the bookstore ran out of textbooks. So I'm telling you that it is extended until Friday at 9 p.m. But if you cannot get 
your material between now and then. You can go through the registration process that's on the syllabus. There's a link to what to do on the very first page of the syllabus. And you can get a free 14 day trial so that you're covered for your first couple of homework assignments. If you're waiting for funds to come in or that kind of thing. Uh, let's see, oh, there were two questions um, that somebody emailed me that I said, oh, I need to talk about that in class. The first one is, do I need to read my textbook? You wanna guess that one? Yes, you need to read your textbook. I'm not going to assign reading. I'm not going to say you need to read pages 16 through 32 tonight. I'm not doing that. We're on chapter one. Guess what you need to read? Chapter one. Okay, you got this. You know, we're going to go through the book front to back. So it, there's not going to be any surprises, but the textbook's really, it's a really good textbook. Um, not only does it talk a lot about clinical applications, but um, they have really good example problems and step-by-step -step of how those problems are solved. Sometimes just looking at it differently from um, just a different perspective helps. And if you have the ebook, and I don't know if you have the code, I don't know if anybody who's gotten the code who didn't get the ebook, um, but if you, there's a link in there for the ebook, I think you might have access. Um, they even have some videos of like people doing some of the problems. So if you just need to see it again, that's another good resource. All right, and the last one. If you watch the videos for today, so what was that, three, four, and five, right? Then, no, four, five, and six. Yeah, thank you, four, five, and six. Um, then you know that we're going to have to do some conversions, right? And so the question was, do we need to memorize all those conversions? And the answer is no, you don't have to memorize all the conversions. I will tell you the conversions you need to memorize. Metric units, those are the only ones you have to memorize. If you have your hard copy, I wish I forgot to bring my hard copy book, but if anybody has the book with them, when you open the back cover, and I'll post it, I'll post, a last period asked me to post, and I'll post it. But if you open the back cover, it's all kinds of conversion factors in there. So it's a really good resource for you while you're doing your homework. But there's one table that says metric conversions, and that's the only one that you have to know. Everything else, I will give to you. Okay? Make sense? All right. That's on my list. Y'all got anything on your list? And I'm sorry I didn't turn on the chat over here. I need to turn on the chat. Okay. Anybody? Okay. So, y'all ready to do a little bit of chemistry now? I'm learning this smart thing. I'm trying. So, remember, if, um, if you have any questions, everybody join the Zoom, and that way you can see the screen a little bit bigger, and you can write in questions. And so, if I miss a question in a chat, would one of y'all out here just Holler at me and say, Dr. B, check the, check the chat. How do we do attendance in the clicker? Do we just log in? You're gonna log in and I'm gonna open one attendance slide right now. That's a really good question. And I'm gonna do this. And then I'm gonna do this. So you can check in with attendance before we start to do our chemistry. Thank y'all for keeping me on track. So even if you're at home, go ahead and try and um, use your iClicker Reef app to sign in for attendance. Am I too loud on the microphone or is it all right? Can you give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? It's not letting me log in. Did I open 4T or 5T? Is anybody else in? No. Oh. Okay, I must have opened 4T again. Okay, let me try. 
Let me try this again. Oh, I bet I did. See, I opened 4T. See, this is, this is why. Now 4T is going to be upset with me because they're going to say, I'm Jackson, I'm Jackson. <sighs> they're not absent. Okay, now try it. Now try it. Ooh, 35 responses. I must have, <laughs> must have done something right. Okay, and then when you're ready, go ahead and pull up your in-class problems, because that's what we're going to work on. I think we ended, we were balancing equations, right? Not letting me on my remote device. So if you cannot log in right now, you need to go to Moodle and, um, let's see if I can log out of here. Okay, so if this does not work for you, then you're going to go to Moodle and you're actually going to click on the 4T today because Dr. B made a mistake and you're going to put your information in here and tell me what's going on. Okay? All right, so we finished with attendance. Do we have everybody? Or I can let it run for another minute or so. Okay. So we need to balance our equations first. Okay. So how would we write the chemical symbols for these molecules we're looking at? And oh, you should, if you have a calculator, you should take it out. We'll use it later in class. But um, that's one thing I did tell last period is that you really do need to be using your calculator in class because if you're just copying down what I do, you're not, you're not actually doing it and you might be making a simple calculator error and you're gonna end up making that calculator error on your homework and even on your exam if you're not doing it in class. If you do it in class and you don't get the answer I get, then that's a red flag and ask for help and I can help you. But if you wait until it's too late, it's too late. Okay, so how would we represent uh, these two gray? What would we write? Like if this were X, we would write X what? X2. And if the red is Y, we're going to call it just plain Y, but it really means one. So then what's our product? X, Y2. Okay. So what I like to do when I'm balancing equations is I like to put each of my elements down the side. So X, Y, right? How many X? Two. So we're looking at all of these reactants. How many Y? One. Okay, products. How many X? One. How many Y? All right, so what are we going to do? Pick one. It doesn't matter. So let's, let's look at X. X is not x is not equal. We need to bring this one up. We're going to bring it up to 2. How do we do that? We multiply by 2. So we put our coefficient. So we get 2, but what else happened? Oh, 4. Mm -hmm. Come on. 2 times 2 is 4. So now we have 4y. So what do we do? So we need to multiply by 4 to get 4. And to do that, we put 4 as a coefficient. Are we done? Yeah, we're done. We're happy. So normally we stop right there. But for this, because they gave us blanks, we're going to put a 1. But usually you don't write it. So if I were going to write this complete balanced equation, I would write it as uh, x2 plus 4. Whoa, how is that working? Okay, I'll write it down here. I would write it as x2 plus 4y yields, why did I do an equal sign? Yields 
uh, 2xy2. Okay. All right, so this next one, let's call this dark gray x, let's call the light gray y, let's call the red a and the green b. So what do we have in our products? x and the red is a, the light gray is y, the green is b. So how many x do we have? One, how many Y? A, G, do the other side, X, Y, A, B, what do we got? One, 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 one. Well, that was really way too easy. <laughs> You're not gonna see that on an exam, but it was kind of nice, right? You got to experience it, okay. Let's try it. I'm going to tell you as we go down, they get a little bit harder. That sounds like a game show, right? The chemistry game show. All right. So what I like to do is list my list all my elements. I have aluminum. I have chlorine. Now, before I start assigning them, I like to go on the other side and write it. That way I write them in the same order. And I get less confused that way. Okay. So how many aluminum? One, chlorine. Go to your products, aluminum, chlorine. All right, my aluminum's good, but my chlorine's not. So there's no way that I can take two and I can multiply it by something to get three. It's not gonna happen. So the trick is, to take those and multiply them by the opposite numbers. So I would take the two and multiply by three and get six. So I would put a three in front of my chlorine. So how do I get six chlorines on the product side? Put a two, All right? I got six, but what else happened? It also affected aluminum. So aluminum times two, so I get two. So now I have to balance aluminum, but that's relatively easy. You can just put a two. But that's a good trick when you're looking at that and trying to figure out what to do. Now, sometimes when that happens, you might end up with coefficients that look like this. Two plus four yields two. What would you do then? I would reduce it. So I would get one plus two yields one. Okay, but we, we didn't have to do that this time. I'm just saying to watch out for it. Okay. Let's do all of our reactants, hydrogen, chlorine, zinc, hydrogen, chlorine, zinc. How many hydrogen? Chlorine's one, zinc's one, hydrogen is two, chlorine is two, zinc is one. What do we want to tackle first? Doesn't matter. We can do hydrogen, that's fine. Okay, so we need to bring the one up to a two, so we're gonna multiply by two, right? So we put a two in front of here. What, what else happened? Chlorine is also in the molecule, so we're gonna multiply by two, we get two. Now we're good. I just like drawing smiley faces. They make me feel happy. All right. Next one, we got silicon, we got oxygen, we got carbon. Okay, my reactants, I have one silicon, I have two oxygen, I have one carbon. One silicon, one... Uh, what am I doing? One oxygen and carbon. In this case, be careful. We have two. So what do we want to start with? Why do you want to start with carbon? Yeah, so it's all by itself. It's not with another element. If it's all by itself, that's a good 
that's a good one to start with so that it doesn't affect anything else in your in your formula okay so times two we want it to balance out so we get a two all right now what now our oxygens aren't equal so if we take our oxygen times two what do we get two so if we put a two there oh but what happened it changed our it changed our carbon so what do we get four are we balanced no we're not balanced so what do we need to do we're gonna we're gonna multiply again right so so instead of doing a two two times two is four right but you have to look at what you're doing to it. You just can't add another two. So what you really started out with was carbon and it's one of them, and we're gonna multiply it by four to get four. So we're just gonna change that coefficient there to a four. Oh no. Yeah. No, 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 no. We have a, um, that's not right. I'm looking at that. That's not right. So we put a two in front of, you get two. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. This one is, I was like, I'm looking at this like this is wrong. Okay, so we have two carbon here and we have a carbon here. So you got to do two plus one, right? So we get three. So wait, let's, let's, let's change this. Where's my eraser? I'm like, ah. Okay. Right? So let's try this again. Let's try this again. So what do we do? We took carbon. We just erase. This is what we started out with, right? So we blue. Okay. So we said carbon on this side was one. What am I doing? One carbon. Okay. So carbon on this side is two, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to multiply by two, but we can't do, we just put a two there. And what happens? We actually have three carbons. So it's actually two plus one is equal to three. So we have three carbons. If we put that coefficient right there, right? So now what do we do? Our oxygen, be careful, your oxygen goes up. So you have two oxygen. Now what do you do? Put a three. See, even I miss that sometimes. But if you go back and you're looking, I'm like, that doesn't add up, that doesn't add up. Okay, go back and check yourself. We all have to do it. All right, next one, we have nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Okay, how many nitrogen? How many nitrogen? Uh, one nitrogen. We have one nitrogen. Oxygen. We have two plus one. That's right, y'all. Three. Hydrogen. We have two. Okay. On this side, we have nitrogen. One here. One here. So we have two. Oxygen. Four. And then hydrogen. One. Okay, now what? So I'm gonna tell you, you should look for elements that are not in more than one compound, right? So if you look here, oxygen is in everything. Don't do that first. Don't do that. <laughs> Work with something a little bit easier first. So um, hydrogen or nitrogen would be a good starting point. Hydrogen is only in, in one in the reactant and only in one in the product. So that's a good place to start. Half of the battle is knowing where to start. So let's see if we can, um, we can use hydrogen to start. I used to erase everything all over it. Okay. All right. So what are we going to do to hydrogen? We want to bring this one up. So we're going to multiply by two. What do we get? Two. So we're going to put our two here. But what did that change? 
So our nitrogen, we now have two nitrogen here and one nitrogen here. So now we have three nitrogens and our oxygen, three times two is six plus one is seven. Okay, now what are we gonna do? What? Okay, let's balance our nitrogen, sure. So what do we wanna add? A three, right? We wanna go up to three. How many oxygens is that? Six plus one is seven. We good? Yay, we're good. Okay, two more. Almost done. Okay, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen. Nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen. All right, nitrogens, how many in reactants? One. Hydrogens? Three. Oxygen? Two. Nitrogen? Two. Hydrogen? Oxygen? One. Okay, now what do we want to do? Which element do you want to pick? Okay. So we've got to bring the oxygen up. So we want to multiply times two. So we're going to put a two here. So that changes our oxygen, but it also changes our hydrogen. So we get four. Now what? If you don't know what to do with the hydrogens, go to the nitrogens. What do we need to do to nitrogen? So we need to raise up our nitrogens. So if we put a two here, that gives us two, but it also changes our hydrogens to six. Okay, we're getting closer. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer. What should we do? So if you get, okay, look, this happens, you get stuck and you're like, oh my God, I don't know what to do next. You could keep plowing through or you could start again, but pick different elements to start with. Like y'all picked elements I wouldn't have started with and that's okay. But if you get to a point where you're like, this is too hard, stop and pick different elements. Don't get like, you know, a huge big scratch paper and go crazy. Just Stop, rewrite your equation, and pick different elements, okay? Don't freak out. So what do you want to do? You want to change the, the hydrogen coefficient? Which, on the products? The nitrogen or the hydrogen? Okay, so you want to change this one to a three? Okay, so if we change this one to a three, what do we get? Six, okay, so how many oxygens? So now it's one times three is three, okay, now what? Can I give y'all a hint? <laughs> let me erase the blues, All right? Let me erase the blues. It's okay, it's okay if you get one and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do, right? What, what I see when I look at this is I see my hydrogens, I'm gonna have to multiply them by each other to get somewhere. So that's kind of where I would have started, right? It's that trick, you know? So if we multiply this times three, so if we put a three here, then what? We're gonna put a two here, so we put a two, right? So what, is this, what does this change for us? So that gives you six here, but what else changed? We get a three, 
Okay, what changed on the other side? Nitrogen is times two. Hydrogen is times three times two is six. Okay, now what are we gonna worry about? Our oxygen. So now what can we do? What if we did this? Times three, what do we get? Six. How could I get six on the other side? I need to what? Multiply by oxygen by two, that gives me six. So instead of having three here, right? Three times two is six. So I really did one times six. So that's a six. But what else changed? That's times two, so this is 12. From what? From three to four on hydrogen. Like, oh, no. Put, no, 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 put four, both the front four on the left side instead. In front of the NH3? So if we change that to a four, right? So one times four is four. Three times four is 12. Ooh, we're getting really close now. I just need I just need here times two and I get four. So two. Now I'm good. So four, three, two, six. You made it. I'm so proud of y'all. I told you they get harder as you go down. I'm very proud of y'all. You stuck with it. So sometimes you just have to stop and kind of go a different route, right? All right. Well, let's try this one. We have carbon, we have hydrogen, we have oxygen. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. How many carbons? Seven hydrogens, 16 oxygen, two carbon, one hydrogen, two oxygen, be careful, three. All right, now what do we wanna do? I'm, I'm looking at this huge number. And I'm thinking I need to get that number up to that huge number. That stands out to me like red flag, right? You, you don't wanna play, play around with little numbers. You're gonna have to get some big numbers to, to get up to 16. So what do we wanna do to our hydrogen? Times eight, okay. So eight times two is 16. What happens to the oxygen? What did I do? Oh, we can't do, oh, oh, we can't do that, right? We have, we really have, we really have two plus eight times one. So that's eight, nine, 10. Now, before I do all that, I'm, there's another red flag. What else do you see? I see my carbon. My carbon's gonna have to change too. So what could you change your carbon to? So I want to multiply this by seven, so I get seven. So I'm going to put that there, but what else happened? It also changed my oxygen. So I have eight oxygen from water, but then I also have 14 here. So what do I get? 22. So my carbons work, my hydrogens work. What about my oxygen? Times 11, 22. So if, you, if you're balancing and you see, okay, we balanced our hydrogens here, but we still had a huge discrepancy in the carbon, go ahead and fix that and then see where you end up. So there's, this is a terrible saying, but it's so, so accurate. It's more than one way to skin a cat. I mean, you know, I love cats. I love them. Don't get me wrong. I have had cats for a very, very long time. I don't currently, but I, uh, I love them to death. So let me put my chat up. I feel bad. Uh, I have not had my chat up. So I can see if anybody else had questions. Okay, so still, we're still good on questions online. All right. So how are we feeling about balancing equations? I'm telling you, that at the bottom was the hardest. Okay? So if you can, if you can survive that, you're good. All right?
If you need help, come see me. We'll zoom me, come zoom me. Put that way. Okay, so we're not gonna save the changes. And we're gonna go back here. All right, so this is the one we were working on last time. So why, why are we bothering doing all these problems? Practice, 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 right? If you do it here and you're successful here, guess where you're gonna be successful? Number one on the homework and then on the test. That's right, that's right. So, so you have practice here and if you struggle, you can ask for help right away. If you have struggling problems on the homework, then you can send me an email, you can Zoom with me and I can help you before you get to the exam. The whole point is before you get to the exam. Okay, so you watched the videos, right? So you heard my, um, my little, it's not a mnemonic device, but it's, it's a little trick to know significant figures. Um, so all you have to remember is that, uh, I guess a little bit of geography and that everybody loves the United States, right? So if you have the US and you know your oceans, right? You know your Pacific is on this side and your Atlantic is on this side. And so that P and that A stands for if your decimal is present or if your decimal is absent. And everybody wants to get into the US. So that's the direction your arrow is gonna go. And when your arrow gets to a non-zero number, stop. So if we look at 18, 1.18, Decimal is present or absent. So if the decimal, so I'm gonna put a little note over here. If the decimal is present, I go this way. If the decimal is absent, I go that way. Okay? So if my decimal is present, so I'm gonna cross these out until I get to my first non-zero number. How many significant figures? Isn't that infinitely better than memorizing rules? I hate memorizing rules. I hate it. It's terrible. I prefer this. But if you want to memorize rules, go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to stand in your way. All right, so B, present or absent? Absent. So I'm going to go in this way. There's my first non zero number. How many sig figs? Okay. C, present or absent? Absent. So I'm coming in this way. How many sig figs? Present or absent? Present. So I'm coming in this way. What does that tell me? Four sig figs. If you got that, you're golden. Okay. All right, let's see. Okay, now complete each of the calculations and give your answers to the correct number of significant figures. There are two rules with significant figures. There's one for multiplication and division. Your answer can't be more significant than your least significant initial value. So the answer must have the same number as the lowest number of significant figures. So in A, we're doing a division. So what's my lowest number of significant figures? Two. So how many significant figures is my answer going to have? Two. But it's different if you add or subtract. If you add or subtract, your answer is the lowest number of places past the decimal, right? So for example, B, how many places past the decimal can my answer be? Answer will be one place past the decimal. Will your calculator give you more than that? Absolutely, your calculator will. Your calculator is not as smart as you are, trust me. Your calculator can just crunch numbers. You have, you have brains, right? You can make decisions. You know about significant figures. So in A, what do you get in your calculator? What do you get in your calculator? I got 3.5416, is that what y'all got? Okay, is that right? I need sig figs, right? So here's my two significant figures. So I'm gonna cut it off here. 
but you have to worry about rounding. So if it's less than five, you're gonna round down, right? So that's 3.5. How about B? I don't even need a calculator for that one. 305, right? Is that right? If you put it in your calculator, that's what you'd come up with. But what should it be? One place past the decimal. So 43.3. Okay, what about C? We're doing multiplication. So how many sig figs? Two and two. So it's the same. So what do you get? Y'all need to put it in your calculators right now. I'm, I'm so serious. Like I see barely anybody putting them in your calculators. If you do it now, you're going to get in the habit of being comfortable with your calculators and comfortable with the calculations. So the more you can do it in class, the better off you are. 715, but we're going to round it because we only need two, so it's point zero 0.07, and this is a five, so it rounds that one up to a two. Good. Okay, D, we're going to subtract, so we need to look at places past the decimal. We have three, and then we have five. So it's gonna be three. So you should get something in your calculator. It should go on and on and on. I got 19.2099. But we only need three places past the decimal, so we're going to round to 19.021. Okay. Good. Yeah. Y'all right. can always give me, give me like a thumbs up or thumbs down in the middle, you know. Oh, good. I like that. I like see, seeing thumbs up and drawing smiley faces and all that. That's all good. Okay. Uh, so, remember when I said there were some conversion factors you had to know? This is one of them. Hint, 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 right? This is one of them you need to memorize, okay? So, it says on average an adult's lung volume is five liters. Convert that to milliliters. So, when you do a conversion, you have to make sure to put whatever you're trying to get rid of on the bottom and whatever you're trying to get to on the top. What's bigger, a liter or a milliliter? A liter, you think about a liter of Coke, right? That's, that's a pretty big bottle. But when you think about a milliliter, a milliliter is a cc. So if you've seen a syringe, right? One milliliter is one cc. So if you just kind of keep in mind a picture of how big those things are, it's gonna make more sense where to put the numbers, right? So it takes a thousand milliliters to make up one liter, right? Because milli is one times 10 to the negative three. I could write a three, okay? So it's 5,000, sorry, 5,000 milliliters, good. Okay, the next one, scientific notation. Remember when we do scientific notation, this is the format we want. Coefficient times 10 raised to some number. What's the big deal about our coefficient though? Must be between one and 10. So your coefficient. So how do I make this A between one and 10? Where am I gonna put my decimal? Between what two numbers? The one and the four. So then you just got to count. And I, I like to do a big jump here. I like to go three, six, right? So 1.4 times 10. Now here's a question for you. Should this be a positive six or a negative six? How'd you know that? It's not that it's a positive number. It's a number bigger than one. It's a number bigger than one, but you're on the right track, right? So if it's bigger than one, your exponent's positive. If it's less than one, your exponent is negative. So we'll look at this, B, we got, a, we got a number that's less than one. So we're gonna put our decimal place to make this 7.9, and we're gonna go one, two times. 
So minus two. <clears throat> okay. Here we want our coefficient between one and 10. So we put that decimal between the three and the five. Now you gotta count one, two, three, four, five, six. So 3.54 times 10 to the negative or positive. And now we're gonna go in the opposite direction. We have scientific notation and we wanna go into decimal format. So if we have a negative, is our final number gonna be bigger or smaller than one? Smaller, so we have to move in this direction, one, two. So that's where my new decimal place is. So I would just like to fill in zeros. So 0 0.074. Next one is positive, so we're going to go in the opposite direction. One, two, three, and just fill in zeros. So three, seven, five, zero. So that's 3,750. Yeah. Okay, negative eight. Ooh, that's a whopper. Well, I guess it's technically the opposite of a whopper. It's tiny. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times, right? But I'm going to tell you a little trick. So you don't have to count all those zeros. You went one time to get on the other side of that number, and then the rest of them are zeros. So however, whatever your negative is here, it's gonna be one less zero. So it's gonna be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, one, nine. And it works, right? It is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Works every time. That way you're not like counting twice. But it doesn't matter, you don't have to do that. All right, uh, express the following numbers in decimal form. Now here's one where we, I'm gonna give you a hint that you have to worry about significant figures. Okay, you have to kind of think about that while you're doing this one. So negative eight, that's really small, right? We're gonna be going in that direction. So I'm gonna put a zero point and I'm gonna do seven zeros because that's a negative eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a one. Am I good? Why do I need those two zeros? They're significant, they're significant, right? Because, because the decimal's present, right? So I would be coming in this way, so all three would be significant. But am I done? I know I make it sound like I'm not, it's because I'm not, I'm missing something. I'm missing my units. Always, always, always put your units. Okay, so the next one, vitamin D dose, 10 to the negative six. So I know I'm gonna have a number less than one. And I'm gonna put one, two, three, four, five. I'm gonna put a five. Am I good? No. Am I good? No. Am I good? Yay! <laughs> All right, now, moving on to percents. How's this working for practice for y'all? Y'all like seeing lots of problems? Yeah. Okay. So express the following numbers as a percent. What do you do to get to, to go from a decimal to a percent? All you have to do is something really easy. Move the decimal place two times because you are multiplying by 100. That's exactly right. So 58% because we moved it one, two. 36 should be, 0.36 should be 36%. Now 0.125 should be 12.5%. I'm glad somebody caught it over here. But really it says report to two significant figures so that should be 13%. Did y'all like my little tip, my little um, how to tip, tip? <laughs> when, when I said, you know, if you're trying to figure out tip, you should tip 20%, right? Because service workers are notoriously underpaid, right? So it's easy to find 10%, right? If, you're, if your bill is $35, to find 10%, that's 3.5, that's $3.05. 
uh, 50 cents, and then you just do it twice, and you should tip them $7. You should tip service workers. You really should. I'm like, y'all, I go on these side rants. You know, you just have to, just have to deal with it. <laughs> okay, express the following numbers as a fraction. How do I do that? How do I go from a percent to a fraction? You put the percent over 100, that's it, okay? So 20 over 100, and very easily you can cancel those last zeros out, and you get two over 10, can you reduce two over 10? Yep, one fifth. 75, go 75 over 100. This one, you should know, three fourths if you use quarters, 75 cents, you got three three quarters. One more, we get you a dollar, so three fourths. Okay, 40 over 100, cancel those last zeros out. Four over 10 reduces two, two fifths. 12%, now this one's a little more challenging. Do it easily, I'll give you the easy thing. What, what are both divisible by? Two. So that gives me six over 50. Could, could I do it again? Yeah, six divided by two is three. 50 divided by two is like that, right? Make it easy on yourself. Don't, don't do the hard stuff, make it easy. Work smarter, not harder. Okay, determine the percent from the numbers given here. When I look at these, I automatically think in a, a number sentence, or I don't know, whatever you call it, but 50 is, is an equal sign, is what, what is always X, percent of 125, right? So if I'm trying to solve for that X, I need to get rid of this percent sign and turn that into over 100, and then just solve for X. So when you're trying to get a variable by itself, what do you do? I have 125 on top, I'm gonna to put 125 on bottom. And I wanna get rid of the 100, so I'm gonna put that on top so that they cancel. And what I do to one side of the equation, I have to do to the other, right? So put in your calculator 100 times 50 divided by 125. What do you get? 40. Okay, let's do B over here. Six is what percent of 600? So I'm gonna get rid of my percent. I'm gonna convert that to 100. Oh, I really didn't give myself enough room. 600 goes on the bottom, 100 goes on top. Cancel them. And then you were smart and you gave yourself room. I know you did, unlike me. <laughs> So you do 100 times 6 divided by 600. So x should be 1, right? 600 divided by 600 is 1. OK, how about c? Now the question is what percent of 300, so x percent of, I just don't write that, it's just of this time, 300 is 15. So it's the same thing, just a slightly different order, so over 100. So I'm going to do the same thing, 100 on top, 300 on the bottom, 100 on top, 300 on the bottom, cancels over here. So then you do x is equal to 15 times 100 divided by 300. So what do you get? 5%. All right, last one of this one. Give myself a little more room. So I got uh, what percent, x percent, oops, not equal sign, of, 
400 is 30. So get rid of the percent, put 100, and then isolate your variable. To do to one side, you do to the other side. X equals 7.5. So it's 7.5 percent. Okay. All right, let's see. We're moving on. Got two sections left. And we're at 2.30. Oh, we're doing good. I feel like we need like the seventh inning stretch. Get up, stretch. No, no. Like crazy. Okay, based on your experience, is each of the following more or less dense than water? If it is more dense, where will it go? Down, it will sink. If it is less dense, it will float. So a paper clip, more or less dense? More dense, it will sink. Table sugar. If you pour sugar in, I mean, before you mix it up, it's gonna dissolve, yes. But if you pour it in, where does it go? Down, it sinks. How about ice? It is less dense. Now, y'all, I'm gonna take a second because this is super important. Water is the only substance on the planet that is less dense in the solid form than the liquid form. It is the only one where the solid will float in the liquid. It's really cool. So why? It makes water super cool, and that's why we're made out of 70% water, because it has this amazing property. But when water is in its liquid form, all the little water molecules are anywhere they want, right? They are swimming around, they're, you can go anywhere. So they can pack very closely together, so they're dense. Now, ice, when it freezes, those water molecules have to orient in a particular location relative to other water molecules. So it actually turns into a crystal. So when you freeze ice, you are making crystals. And so because of that orientation, there has to be a particular amount of space between the water molecules. And so it ends up being less dense, less packed, in the solid state than in the liquid state. It's all because of hydrogen bonding, and it's really cool. Okay, that was my side rant. <laughs> all right, uh, calculate density in grams per milliliter of two liters of gasoline that weighs 1.32 kilograms. What was that formula for density? You know how I remember it? It's like going to the DMV. <laughs> That's how I remember the order. DM, it's DMV. Whenever I, whenever I think density, I think DMV. Okay, but the important thing is, what are my units on density? Grams per milliliter. That's my. Those, those are my units. Is that what I'm given in the question? No, it's not. Now I don't like this question. Because if you didn't convert the units, you would still get the right answer. And so it's a very poorly designed question. But I'm going to show you what you should do. You should look at these values and you should say, those values are not in the right units. And so I'm going to convert those units before I calculate my density. So I'm going to say density is equal to my mass, which is 1.32 kilograms. But I can't leave it in kilograms, right? So I'm going to convert it. I'm going to put kilograms on the bottom and grams on the top. What's bigger, a kilogram or a gram? Kilograms much bigger, much bigger. By how much? So this is another one of those hint, hint, double, triple, quadruple hint. These are one of the ones you got to memorize. Um, it's a thousand. So you have a thousand grams in one kilogram. So I'm going to put that over my uh, volume, which is 2.0 liters, but I can't leave it in liters. I definitely didn't give myself enough room on this one. So I want liters on the bottom, and I want milliliters on top, 
So there are a thousand milliliters and one liter. So what does that give me on the top? One, three, two, oh. Right, 1.32 times 1,000. So this is now in grams, which is what I want it to be. And then that would be 2,000 milliliters. And now I can put that into my calculator and I can get density. But because they did each one by a factor of 10 to the three, you could have put it into your calculator and it would have worked. But then I might've cried a little bit. So what do you get? What did I get? I got 0 0.66. Is that what you get? Yes. Grams per milliliter. Good. Okay. So the next one talks about specific gravity. So when we talk about specific gravity, I gave you the formula right up here, right? Whenever we calculate specific gravity, what we're doing is we're comparing the density of some substance to water. So it's always a fraction, right? Um, and water has a density of one. So we're going to put some number. In this case, we're saying the specific gravity of the ocean is 1.025. Is this more or less dense than tap water? What this is telling us is that we put some number over one and we got an answer of 1.025. So my question to you is, is X bigger or smaller than one? It's bigger, right? It's bigger. So it is more dense. Good. All right, let's see. Oh, this is one of my not so favorite ones, right? Y'all watch my video. You know what I call Fahrenheit. That is the F word. We don't use Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit is English. We should not use English um, units. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you a quick story. Y'all, I have too many stories, but I think y'all like them, right? Yeah, okay. So this is why we should all use metric. So the United States was doing this um, collaboration project to send a probe to Mars. That's an expensive project, right? <laughs> we were collaborating with some European um, scientists. And so we did our calculations in English because we're America. They did their calculations in metric because that's what the rest of the world does. <laughs> Guess what? We didn't convert back to metric or they didn't convert to English, whatever. Somebody didn't convert. And so they did the calculation to see how much fuel that probe should burn in order to get into orbit around Mars. Well, they gave it too much fuel. And guess what happened? Plowed right through the atmosphere and burned up in the atmosphere. Do you know how much money was wasted? Because we didn't convert units. It's just units. Moral of the story. We should use metric units. Everyone should use metric units. So Fahrenheit is the big F word for me. All right, so we need to, um, in this question, we're talking about fetal cord blood that's stored at negative 112 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Uh, calculate this temperature in Kelvin. So I want to go from Fahrenheit and I want to get to Kelvin. Can I go straight from Fahrenheit to Kelvin? I can't. I can't do it. I got to go through Celsius first. Am I going to make you memorize the formula? No. Uh -uh. I'll give that to you. I'll give that to you. You just got to be able to use it. You got to be able to use it. So in the one above, we were doing the opposite. We were going from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Now we have to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So the equation is going to be just a little bit different. Um, so we want to solve for Celsius. So if we have Celsius, what we're going to say is our degrees Fahrenheit uh, minus 32 times one degree Celsius over 
1.83 Fahrenheit. Okay? But you don't have to memorize it, you have to use it. So what are we going to plug in? A negative 112 degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 times 1 degree Celsius over 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So put it into your calculator, subtract negative 112 minus 32 and then divide by 1.8. And what you should get is negative 80. But try it out. It's one of those times you should try out your calculator. Am I done? Nope. I need, I need to eventually get to Kelvin. So my, my formula for that is Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273 degrees. So Kelvin is equal to negative 80 plus 273. What's my Kelvin temperature? What do you get? 193. If you ever get a Kelvin temperature that's negative, you did the calculation wrong. Because in the Kelvin system, the lowest temperature you can get is absolute zero. It's where you have absolutely no particle movement, so you can never have a negative number. If you get a negative number, that's a really good indication, whoa, I did something wrong. I need to go back and check. Okay. Oh yeah, this was really good. We were talking about the different kinds of energy present. So anything that, anything that we eat is like a storage molecule, right? It's got glucose, it's got protein, it's got whatever nutrients in there and then you're going to eat it digest it and break it down and when you break the bonds that are inside of that food you're going to be releasing energy to use to do all of your normal body functions in addition to moving and that sort of thing so it's important to understand how kind of generally how energy works so here they're doing a an example where we have a little kid and he's climbing first He's going to climb a ladder. He's going to get to the top of the ladder and then he's going to slide down. And if he's anything like my child, he's going to do it again another about a thousand times. So what kind of energy is present when that kid is climbing the ladder? Oh, there's all kinds of different answers. All right. So I'm going to say, I'm not going to tell you. And let's go to what kind of energy does he have at the top? He definitely has potential. Everybody can agree on that. He has potential energy. Now, he's at the top. Like, can you picture yourself? You're like on the bicycle, right? At the top of that really tall hill. And you're like, yes, it's about to be awesome. And you go down the hill, right? You're going down the hill. You're sliding down the slide. What kind of energy is that? Kinetic, right? You turn that potential energy into kinetic energy. So now let's think about the climb. I'm not at the bottom of the hill and I'm not at the top of the hill. So what kind of energy am I when I'm in the process of climbing? Both potential and kinetic. You're actually in the process of converting kinetic to potential. And technically, if you're in the slide, you're technically converting potential to kinetic. But at the bottom of the slide, you know, but, you know. Okay. Now we're going to talk about energy, energy consumption, right? So we're saying we're going on a moderate walk and we're going to burn 225 calories. Oh, there's two different kind of calories. What calories are these? Or is this the energy calories or is this the nutritional calories? How did you know it was nutritional? The big C, that's the big C, so this is nutritional. Because we know there are a thousand K 
calories in one nutritional calorie. I usually write the nutritional calorie just as a big C, so I know it's the big C. Okay, so we, that's our moderate walk. We're burning, burning that many calories per hour. Calculate the number of joules burned by this activity. Well, I'm gonna need another conversion factor. You don't have to memorize it, I would give it to you. But we, we need to know that we have four point, what is it, four point, I wanna get the things right, 4.184 joules in one calorie, and that's the energy calorie. That's an equal sign. Okay, so we're starting out with 225 big C calories, and we're burning that many per hour. So what I want to get rid of, I'm going to put on the bottom. What I want to get to, I'm going to put on the top. So I know I have a thousand energy calories and one nutritional calorie. And then I'm gonna do another conversion. I wanna get rid of my calories and I wanna to get to joules. I know I have 4.18, no, 4. Yeah, 184 in one calorie. So my units cancel, what do I get? What did I get? I got 9.41400. So, am I done? What didn't I do? I need my units, joules per hour. Am I done, done? Significant figures, how many significant figures do I have? Three. So my answer has to be in three SF. So that really should be nine four one zero zero zero. Don't just drop off those numbers. Be careful because some people will come in and say, "Oh, okay, well it rounds down, so that's nine hundred and forty-one." Is that the right answer? No, 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 no. Don't do that. Okay. I try to point out all those little places where you can go wrong while we're in class and doing this so that we don't make those mistakes on homework and we don't make those mistakes, um, especially on exams, right? Okay, so which, the next one we're talking about is specific heat. And specific heat, right, specific heat has a unit of calories, per grams degrees Celsius. So when we talk about specific heat, specific heat is the amount of energy required to raise one gram of any material, one degree Celsius. So do you think we should have things in our body that have a high specific heat or a low specific heat? What do we want in our bodies? We want high. We absolutely want high. Because if we step outside on a hot Louisiana day, because you know it gets hot, and we have a low specific heat in general of the composition of our bodies, the water would evaporate and we would, we would perish. <laughs> but water, really cool, has a very high specific heat capacity. It has a specific heat capacity of one. So relatively, it takes a lot of energy to heat water up which is great for us, it allows us to keep our body temperature constant, right? It's not good if our temperature gets too high and it's not good if our temperature gets too low. So having a high specific heat capacity um, or specific heat of water is really great. So I'll tell you that water, right, has a specific heat capacity of one uh, calorie per gram degree C, right? But salt, has a specific heat capacity of 0.21, okay? So what do you think is gonna have a higher specific heat, water or salt water? Water is gonna have a higher. So water will be higher, right? We're mixing two substances together. 
And so that specific heat is going to be a combination of the two. Well, if you put salt in with water, it's going to drop the specific heat capacity. So salt water will have a lower specific heat capacity than pure water. And if you needed those numbers, I would give you a table with those numbers. But you don't have to memorize them. But you might have to apply logic, but you don't have to memorize them. Okay. All right, oh, this, this is like the easiest, right? State of matter that has a definite volume but takes the shape of its container. What do we got? Liquid. Particles of the state of matter that are so far apart they do not interact very much with each other. They do interact, but not much. What? Gases. They do interact. So it's a very little bit of a lie there. All right, getting close. Consider the following measurements determined for a known volume of 10 milliliters. So we're starting out and we know we have 10 milliliters. This is, uh, this application, you really, you really do need to understand, um, especially in a clinical setting, right? Like what instrument do you want to deliver um, 10 milliliters of medication to a patient? Do I want to use a beaker to measure that volume out or might I want to use a graduated cylinder and why? Right, and those might not be your pieces of equipment to choose from, but this is a good application for, I'm looking at numbers, now which one is the right measurement tool? So in this case, we have a graduated cylinder and a beaker. So we're asking about precision and accuracy. Tell me about precision. What does precision mean? It's not necessarily your goal, but it's all in the same place. So the book had the textbook, it was the, the goalie, right? And if you hit it, if you kick the ball in the same place, that's precision. So these, these are values are close together. Close together, right? How about accuracy? Values close to, what does true mean? to the actual or the goal because we said what's our actual over here 10 milliliters right okay so now which set of the measurements is more precise what do we have a tighter grouping on definitely the graduated cylinder right more precise is the graduated cylinder Because you go up to 10.5 and you go down to 9.5. That's pretty, that's pretty close. Whereas here we're going all the way down to 8 and all the way up to 12. Okay, which set of measurements is more accurate? It's really the cylinder again. It's really the cylinder again. How did you know that? Well, so you would look at each individual value and how close is each individual value to the answer. What would happen, do it in your calculators real quick, what if you took an average? So add these numbers up and divide by three. So 10 plus 9 plus 5, 0.5 plus 10.5, what do you get? How many? Divide by three if you got 30, divide by three. So you get 10 milliliters. What about this one? If we average these, what do we get? So 12 plus 8 plus 9 divided by 3. 9.6, 9.7, something like that. So when you average it, they actually average closer to the goal with the graduated cylinder, right? They're actually pretty close. But even though you get a close value to the goal, Look at the range in that. That's terrible. That's terrible. You do not want to use a beaker to measure volume. Don't do that. Right? Okay, so which measuring device for volume is more accurate? We want the graduated cylinder. Okay. All right, let's see. Let's try again. 10 minutes. Okay, now we're going to start to get into right three o'clock. Am I crazy?
I'm good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, now we're going to get into using multiple conversion factors. It's not so much about. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it ends at 250. Y'all have done them. Go. <laughs> Y'all gotta tell me these things. Like, Dr. you're a little bit crazy. Okay, I'm gonna check my chats and see if anybody has any questions that I missed. Maybe. I'm trying. Okay, so everybody on the chat is good. Virtual, y'all are done. If you have any questions, need any help, come see me and have a wonderful Thursday, no, Friday Eve. Have a wonderful Friday Eve. Okay, so I think I'm going to end. Oh, I can end this poll too. Golly, y'all, that went all class period. So remember, clickers have to work for Tuesday. When you're finding out the numbers that you had here, right? Let me do this way, right? You had 10 plus 9.5 plus 10.5, and then you divide it by however many numbers you had. So we had three. So do this first in your calculator, and then divide by three. Oh, still not. Okay. Like, it lets me do it if I like if I go on the actual website. But I know you said like because it won't, it won't it won't communicate with yeah. Moodle, and then your grades won't transfer yeah. over, and that would be very very bad. Okay. Yeah. Um. Go through. Go to the go to like Google Pearson Student Support. What y'all got? While she's googling that, we can. That's due. That's due Monday. Okay. Chapter one is due Monday at nine p.m. Okay. Monday at 9 p.m. What was switched to Friday? The, the Mastering Chemistry, like, introduction. Oh, it was okay. due last night at 9. But, like, we got, I don't know, what is up with Pearson? But we had some technical things. So I extended it until Friday at 9. Okay. Just so that everybody, once everybody gets online, all that kind of stuff, then you can do the actual science homework, right, by Monday at 9. Okay. I just had a question about homework. Sure. Sure. Is there a pet feeling with a Yeah? I don't really understand. Okay, so so when you think about chemicals, what you're probably thinking about is like is one molecule of this and one molecule of that. But when you have wound healing, what you have is chemicals, cells secreting chemicals, right? Saying, ouch, I'm hurt, oh my gosh, right? And then other nearby cells, like white blood cells, are attracted to those, are called um, cytokines, are attracted to those cytokines. Um, and, and so they recognize those chemicals, and then it tr triggers chemical reactions that occur within the cell. And it's like, it's like metabolism, right? There's so lots of chemistry going on, even though you know, you're like, oh, I'm just eating a hamburger, right? I'm just chewing it up. It's physical. But no, you're not just chewing it up chemically breaking it down. Yeah. So it's the same thing with wound healing. And then you're increasing cell division. And so there's all kinds of chemical reactions that go on to make those cellular processes happen. Okay. So if the cellular process, chemical. Yeah, I was just thinking about like the actual physical act of it happening and the chemical. Yep, yep. Okay. Okay. What do they got? Technical support. Learn I, more. I did everything they told me to I cleared my yeah. Let's, and let's all go. That stuff. Okay. Pearson support, like like we did your checklist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any issues? Where's like contact us? That's what I would want. Probably the bottom. Yeah, they like it there. So, because I think I think you've done everything. So try to yeah. contact them. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Okay. Let's do it right now while you got. Okay. Key category. Course, probably course error. Right here? Right there. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And you're not a robot. Oh. No, keep going. 
Mastering chemistry. Nope, not a robot. Okay. Oh. Are they available? Can we chat right now? <laughs> Let me close this stuff out and I'm log out. I'm stressing about it the whole class. I'm like, I can't concentrate because it's stressing me out. Oh, did I not stop this? Like, this calling. is still going on. Our Zoom is still going on. <laughs> okay, I can end this.